My name is Stephen Minnis and I'm joined today by Dr. Victor Katan. Victor is a postdoctoral research fellow at the National University of Singapore's Faculty of Law. Victor, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. You've given a, a presentation today about the International Court of Justice and decolonisation, specifically the South West Africa cases. And there's an interesting relationship here in that the ICJ's decisions were, of course, important in that process of decolonisation, but the process of decolonisation itself also impacted the composition and the opinions of the ICJ. So mm -hmm. there, is, there is a feedback here going in both directions. Uh, yes, uh, uh, there is. Uh, and we can see the composition of the court changing um, after the 1966 uh, judgment, which was very controversial um, because of the uh, the absence of uh, Zafrullah Khan from that judgment and the reaction uh, by the UN General Assembly uh, to that decision. And, 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 that, and that decision was essentially um, viewed as being uh, favourable to the respondent, namely South Africa. Um, and the UN responded essentially by um, the UN General Assembly by terminating the uh, the mandate uh, or, or purporting to terminate the mandate uh, over South West Africa and also uh, taking steps to um, uh, cease funding for certain aspects of the operation of the International Court of Justice and then you had this uh, change of, of, of judges coming from um, uh, you know, various parts of, of the, of the so-called third world developing world um, and that would have an impact uh, on the 1971 uh, Namibia opinion although I do think that had the and Zafrullah Khan and the two other judges been on the court in 1966. One passed away, the another was ill. Uh, it, it was no foregone conclusion that, that they would have vo uh, voted in favour of the uh, respondent in those cases. You mentioned just now the mandate uh, of South West Africa. Yeah. Now, this was a holdover from the period of the League of Nations, wasn't mm -hmm. it? And part of that legal inheritance that the broader United Nations system, but in this case particularly the ICJ, had to get to grips with in the years after the Second World War. Uh, that's right, yeah. So um, well, one of the issues uh, that arose in the case of the mandates and the, uh, or the dissolution of the League of Nations uh, was that there were certain mandates um, that were still operating, um, and, uh, namely uh, specifically Palestine and South West Africa, and the issue was what to do with these mandates because the supervisory machine had changed. Um, you know, there was no League of Nations Council anymore. There was the UN trusteeship system, but it wasn't clear whether there was any obligation on mandatory powers to conclude trusteeship agreements for these um, territories. And so, so part of the dispute that arose initially um, was whether South Africa could retain control over South West Africa and apply its uh, law and administration there to alter the status of South West Africa and the court said um, that it could not do so and that it had an obligation to transmit reports to the UN General Assembly even though it wasn't a, a, a clear successor to the League of Nations. Um, one interesting issue that was raised in the judgment uh, was the issue of whether there was an obligation on South Africa to enter into new negotiations in good faith to conclude a trusteeship agreement and the court was quite divided. There was the majority, although there were six dissents on this issue, um, ruling that there was no such obligation. And of course, South Africa had been invited by the United Kingdom to administer the territory yes, yeah. of South West yeah, Africa. Yeah. So the, the, the principle was non-annexation non, non following the First World War. So, um, so South Africa was only, uh, it didn't, have, didn't acquire sovereignty over the territory, only a right of administration, kind of benevolent relationship of an advanced nation, as Article 22 of the League of Nations Covenant says, to, to bring up uh, the, you know, the, the, pe the peoples of this uh, country so they could stand alone, which meant independence. Yes, and, and these were the rather complicated arrangements which then came before the ICJ for decision yeah. in several That's cases. Right. And, and central to, to this uh, story is the figure of um, Zafrullah mm -hmm. Khan, yeah. who is in many respects a singular figure. How did you come to research him and his role? Well, I wrote a book a few years ago on um, the uh, origins of the uh, Israel-Palestine issue, looking at the mandate period. And Zafrullah Khan's name kind of leaps out of the pages if you ever take the time to read the UN General Assembly debates on the partition of Palestine. They're very clear, very eloquent, uh, criti criticising the plan as unworkable and being unfair to the Arab side for various reasons. 
So I first came across his name in that context, and then when I went to do my PhD, which was looking at partition more generally, I, I discovered his name again in the context of the India, the partition of the Punjab especially, and he was involved in, you know, it was in three months he was involved in both cases. Yes. Um, and so specifically, the connection to, to this case, his connection to South Africa, arose out of research um, that I did uh, for um, uh, looking into him, and it, I came across a file of a, of a critique by uh, Judge Gerald Fitzmaurice, uh, a telegram to the United Kingdom delegation to the UN about uh, nominating him to be a judge, and it wasn't that really relevant to the research I was doing then, but I thought there's a story here. Uh, let me file this and come back to it at a later point, which is what I did when I moved to Singapore. And, and Gerald Fitzmaurice said, as, as the Foreign Office's legal advisor, that uh, Zafrullah Khan uh, would be extremely difficult to influence. Yeah. And this was a point against appointing him as a yes, judge. Yes, yeah, yeah. So it seems one would think yeah. that this was a <laughs> point. So they had to, yeah, exactly. Yes. No, I think, I think the British were hoping to retain influence over certain judges who they knew from the colonial period. Because yes. Britain was an empire and... Uh, Many of the judges coming from the Indian subcontinent would have studied in this country. I mean, Zafar Khan himself was a student of King's College London, a uh, law student here. So they would have... In fact, in fact, the funny thing is Zafar Khan was seen as pro-British mm. for many years because of that background, because he worked in the civil service in India for many years, or as a judge in India. And therefore, I think the opprobrium that Fitzmaurice vented in that telegram was as a result of you know, changes or, or opinions that Zafar Khan made when he was... Foreign Minister for Pakistan in the late 1940s, early 50s, particularly in this instance on the nationalisation of Iran's oil facilities. Um, or British, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, BP was involved. I think it was BP or Shell. But. And so that was the context. So he would have been seen a bit as a turncoat, you know, someone who was one of our boys and he's now, he's now you know, he's no longer playing, uh, uh, you know, uh, on our side. Yes. Kind of thing. So by the time of the 1966 South West Africa case, mm -hmm. Zafrullah Khan had made it onto the ICJ as a permanent judge, mm -hmm. despite significant opposition from the UK, but mm -hmm. not interestingly from the United States. Yeah, I should also say that the, that the UK, the UK, there was a division between the legal advisers and the political arm of the Foreign Office. The political arm of the Foreign Office was always in favour of Zafrullah. That's why they kept nominating or kept forwarding his name to be considered for nomination by the national group. And it was only from the legal advisor, and it was particularly from Fitzmaurice that, they, that his name suddenly disappeared from, from that list. Um, but you're right, the US played a big role because of the shift in American policy in the late 1950s, early 60s, from one uh, kind of supporting, if you like, the, this allies, Britain, Canada, France, Australia, or really the, the colonial powers, to one of not supporting them on colonial issues. And uh, the reason, as I explained in the lecture, was the shift in US policy was because of race relations it was in the United States and the fear that many of the countries in America in Africa who were becoming independent and becoming members of the United Nations were um, moving into Russia the USSR socialist camp and the fear was that they had to do something about this and they had to change their foreign policy as well as their internal laws mm. um, and that comes out clearly in this, in this case so there are clearly major issues of decolonization and the Cold War in the background. In the 1966 case concerning South West Africa, mm -hmm. what was immediately at issue there and, and what happened in, re in respect of uh, Zafrullah Khan? Well, the issue in 1966, it all begins before the actual judgment. So to understand uh, why Zafrullah Khan didn't participate in that case, you have to go back to 1962. In 1962, the, or even earlier, 1961, um, the applicants, that's Ethiopia and Liberia, the, or I should, I should say the, 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 the counsel for the applicants, uh, Ernest Gross, approaches Zafrullah Khan when he's Pakistan's permanent representative at the United Nations in New York to see if he would be willing to sit as a judge ad hoc mm. in the first phase of the cases, which is on jurisdiction and admissibility. And he, he says, yeah, I'm happy to do that. However, there's consternation amongst Sir Percy Spender, the Australian judge, and Sir Gerald Fritz Morris, a British judge, about his possible appointment as a judge ad hoc. And uh, as a result of documents which are in the National Archives in Australia and amongst Sir Percy's personal papers at the National Library of Australia, um, it, it became apparent the opposition was really those two, but they somehow persuaded their colleagues to write a letter to Zafrullah Khan inquiring whether he felt there was any impediment that would prevent him from sitting in the case 
the case is because of Israel or the UN. So Furla Khan replies and says, there isn't because I, my participation in these debates was vicarious. I was only a chairman. I wasn't participating in the delegation and such. And moreover, I've informed my government that I will not participate in any of these situations in view of the fact that the applicants want to appoint me as a judge ad hoc. Now, uh, the letter then goes back to the court and, and then there's a big discussion about it. Fis Morris and Percy Spender say, we don't believe uh, what Zafir Khan's saying. And uh, they say, we'll send him another letter. So, But the court says, well, we have to. So we'll just ask, send him a letter, a simple letter, inquiring whether he, he, he leaving it to him to decide whether or not he should sit. And so Zafir Khan said, you know, says, well, look, you know, I can, clear, I can clearly see that there's some issue in the court that you're not confident in having me and I don't want to put you in this, this, this un, uncomfortable position so I will not participate in the, uh, the, the, as a judge ad hoc. Now the reason why this is important for 1966 is because in 1964 Zafir is appointed, elected a permanent member of the court and, uh, and this time Sir Percy Spender is the president of the court and in that capacity he immediately in the same 1964 goes to see Zafir in his office or calls him to his office and says, I don't think you should participate in, these, in the merits of the dispute either because, you know, you didn't sit in, you refused to sit in the, uh, the, the preliminary objections phase, so there's some issue there. Of course, the Shula Khan was shocked and said, but the reason why I didn't participate, nothing did, you know, was not because there was a conflict of interest or my involvement in any issue. I explained that mm -hmm. in 1962, and I intend to sit in the cases. But Percy Spender clearly didn't want him to and, uh, and threatened to, uh, you know, use an uh, Article 24 it's, it's, it's part of the statute of the ICJ where you can call, where there's a dispute between two judges on this particular issue, you can convene all the judges to vote on the issue. Yes. But interestingly, as I explained in the talk, uh, Percy Spender, although he threatened to do this, to use this procedure, he never actually did. Mm. And the reason I say from reading over Percy Spender is because he knew he didn't have the majority. It was really him and Fitzmaurice who were kind of um, creating this, this, this problem as, as a Frula Khan. Then I, I explained how he was upset, the Frida was upset, it was a whole issue that he decided, you know, not to take part, not officially. I mean, he, he said, I want to sit, but you're preventing me, so what can I do? Mm. I'll just sit out. Um, and of course, I, I should also add that, that behind this so-called technical dispute about whether or not he could sit were larger issues. Both it's more, uh, sorry, by fact, it's more as well, but both Percy Spender and Zafrul Khan knew each other intimately. They had both been foreign ministers for their countries, and they had both, in that capacity, in the UN, taken opposing sides on various colonial questions. And that was really the issue that was driving uh, the opposition to Zafrul at that time. And how did this then result in terms of the disposition of that case? With, well, with the absence uh, yeah, of, of course, the absence. So, so there's an unusual set of circumstances. Uh, so there were essentially, um, so there are normally 15 judges without a judge ad hoc. And um, one judge passed away, one judge was sick, and Zafir Khan didn't turn up. And therefore, uh, and, therefore and, and all those judges were presumed to be on the side of the applicant states. So the result was, by eliminating or not having three of these judges, it was going to go into a tie. Because the seven judges who had, um, were against the, the preliminary objections phase in 1962 were still there. But the, on the other side, that wasn't the case. So it, was going to, so it went into a 7-7 tie, and so Percy Spender, being the president of the court, had two votes. At the time, he had an extra vote. So, yeah, so he swung it in favour of the respondent. Mm. I mean, this story just finally illustrates, I suppose, both the personal and the political dimensions of international law, which are sometimes neglected. Yeah. And it's, it comes out so clearly here, because you do have two people who have both been diplomats, who have both been foreign ministers for their countries. And of course, are, are very aware of political manoeuvring and, and oh, as participants. Yeah. It's it's interesting to have this look into what happens uh, behind the simple text of the judgment that yeah. we receive. Yeah, gives it a lot more depth, and you can really understand, read between the lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the 1971 Namibia opinion is clearly Zafrullah's opinion, and it's almost it's almost as though it's it's clearly 1971 is what the um, what should have been produced in 1966. By which time Zafrullah has been elected yeah. president. And of course, yeah, I should have said that. Yeah, Zafrullah was elected president of the court in 1970, and he defeated Gerald Fitzmaurice in that in that election. Mm -hmm. So clearly, he something was going on inside the court yes. at that time. So uh, yes, it was a you know very um, uh, it's, it's crucial to know all this if, if, 
who would have a proper understanding of that, that opinion. Yes, and, and a fascinating look into the process behind the ICJ's uh, judgments. Victor Katan, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.